So this is the second part of the key data resources, but this is going to focus on historical floods and perception thresholds and their representation in our flood frequency analysis. So this time, like I said, we'll focus on the historical floods, which will be represented by flow intervals and perception thresholds that are represented in, by intervals as well. And we ought to make sure that we understand the importance of examining historical records so that information can be used to extend our period of record with flow intervals and perception thresholds. Again, this presentation has a lot of web resources shown as URLs that provide additional information and you can use and reference in your flow frequency analysis. So to do this kind of work, we need to put our detective hats on. Um, and if, if we can, get your boots on and go into the field or go into libraries, et cetera. So the example we're showing here is a, from a TVA and it highlights the importance of personal interviews, use of diaries and multiple sources of information to develop a reliable data on extreme floods outside of our gauging period. Um, the photo on the right is from the record stage and the flood on the Shenandoah River in Harpers Ferry prior to the 1936 flood. And you can read this one on your own, but it's just explaining the importance of all the different ways you need to investigate to get the best information you can about these historic floods. So here's a key definition of a historical flood. Um, it is the largest flood that was estimated to have occurred over an extended period of time. Besides a maximum stage, these data can also include discharge estimates and other sources. Key information includes one or more extreme floods, a reference stage for perception threshold, and information to estimate the beginning of the historical period. So some key information, like I said, would be large floods prior to a gauge. A reference stage might be a railroad bridge or a building in a town center. Um, finding knowledge that the largest flood in the gauge has not been exceeded in a longer time frame, so older than the date that we found that historic flood on, and just knowing when the town settled, that can be that can help us establish the beginning of our historical period. Flood high water marks on buildings are common in Europe and can be found in the United States as well for very large floods. Um, this is an ancient building in Koblenz on the Rhine. It shows, it shows a high water mark of a flood in 651, uh, which is the highest known stage. And it's also compared to more recent floods in the picture on the right. So I know these are more common in Europe, but we've seen them in America too, and they can be really valuable. So here's an example of the June 1921 flood that devastated the city of Pueblo, Colorado on the Arkansas River. Um, there were many lives lost, and this illustrates the high water mark on the railroad depot as shown on the lower photos here. So we have a photograph and also a historical high water mark. Yeah, it's a sad part about our jobs and reading things like 1500 life loss, but now they have a dam to protect that city. So. So here's an example of the data that you can find on extreme floods. Um, information on the June 1921 extreme flood was extensive. They even issued a special issue of ASCE transactions that was published in the USGS reports. Um, Alan Hazen in his 1931 book examined the effects of this flood and used it to develop a precursor to the regional index flood method um, for regional coefficients of variation in skew estimates and flood frequency. So taking the data that we learned from the 1921 flood, plus some additional paleo flood data, example four in bulletin 17C appendix 10 um, was input into RMC best fit to show the period of record here. So we have flow intervals that are shown with air bars. So that's the historical 1921 flood here and uh, additional historic flood information in 1864 and also in 1893 and 1894. Okay, so historical floods are shown um, with our best estimate, but also an a flow interval as well. Perception thresholds are shown as the solid red areas. And we'll talk more specifically about those later. Yes, another question. Yeah, so the question was, we have systematic data prior to 1921 and after 1921. So 1921 happened in our systematic period of record. Um, most likely it's because the gauge got washed out and there's probably some uncertainty about how big that flood really was. 
they're probably looking at high water marks and going back and using cross sections to calculate it indirectly. So here's a listing of key sources to search for historical flood data. Um, digital libraries are your gateway to newspapers, photos, diaries, and a ton of other information. The Internet Archive is a good place to obtain history books from cities and towns, such as the 1958 Waterbury, Connecticut history book that was mentioned in our previous presentation. So after you've gathered all of your data, now is the time to accurately describe and represent all flood data appropriately with flow intervals and perception thresholds for our flood frequency analysis. But first, let's start with Bulletin 17C de definitions for flow intervals and perception thresholds so you have that background. And then we'll translate that into best fit. So this is a perception threshold. The perception thresholds are shown here with a gray area here. And then again, the interval data shown with that flow range. All right. And you see we have three different perception thresholds for this analysis. One for the modern time period, historical and paleo flood. And there's also the flow, the four flow intervals that we showed as well. Sorry. So the question is, what did they use to define the flow range for these flow intervals? I'm not sure what they used for this example here. It's in the appendix of Bulletin 17C if you want to look more. But yeah, we'll talk about some um, rules of thumb that we use for our modern analysis. So in Bulletin 17C, though, the intervals are designated by a QY lower and a QY upper. And those are based, those are based on observations, written records, or physical evidence. And again, we also have rules of thumbs if we, if we don't have uh, enough in information to quantify what that uncertainty is. Perception thresholds are designated as TY lower and TY upper, and technically systematic data are interval data as well. Just the QY lower is equal to the QY upper, so it ends up just being a single data point. So systematic and interval designations, I think, are fairly clear here. Either we're, we're sure enough that we just represent it as a single value, or we have uncertainty about it, so we represent it as a range. <clears throat> um, perception thresholds are a little bit trickier to understand. Um, Bulletin 17C defines the lower bound as the smallest peak flow that would result in a recorded flow, and the upper bound as the largest peak flow that could be observed or recorded. So when Bulletin 17C describes the lower bound, it's the top of the gray area. Okay, It's this top line. That's the lower bound meaning it's the lowest that we would want to designate from a period of record that we know where they're recording data. And the upper bound isn't known, so it's designated as infinity. That's how Bolton 17C describes it. So it's actually the area above the gray curve. That's how you define it, from some flow to infinity. All right. So from Bolton 17C, there's a good list of typical values listed for gauging stations, crest stage gauges, historical floods, and potentially influential low floods. This is just a reference from bullets from Appendix C, or Appendix 3, I'm sorry. So now this is the same data set we were just looking at for Pueblo, but we're looking at it in RMC best fit. So just like in Bulletin 17C, systematic data is exact data, meaning the upper and lower bounds for the flow are equal. So it's simply the exact flow measurement. Each. Sorry. So the interval data. Sorry, the animations are giving me a little trouble here. So interval data is defined as an upper and lower bound. Um, in best fit, you can see that we also enter a most likely flow, and that's what informs the the blue or green dot there in the center. So this is the likelihood. Sorry. And remember that the likelihood, so, okay, I'm going to skip that because we move things around a little bit. We're referencing that back to the likelihood, and we're going to talk about that in a later slide. All right, so now on to perception thresholds. They have the same concept as we talked about in Bulletin 17C. However, you need to think about them a little bit differently in best fit. So in best fit, you're just entering a single value to represent that perception threshold. 
It's just the flow value that defines the top of the red area, okay? That flow value represents the flow at which, if a flood had occurred, it would have exceeded that threshold flow and been recorded. So therefore, the perception threshold is an upper bound with the lower bound equal to zero. But it's automatically equal to zero. You don't have to input that into the software. So the shaded red, reddish area reflects that any flood event in that period would range from zero up to that perception threshold value. Um, in many cases, you will find historical flood data with a stage or a stage and a peak flow. But it isn't too often that historical floods will have enough certainty that is considered as exact data. Therefore, we often need to calculate an upper and lower bound. At the level of study, may determine the techniques used to find those bounds. So for periodic assessment, you may only really have time to use a simplified approach by applying something like plus or minus 20%. That's the rule of thumb. Uh, that Devin mentioned earlier. So this is loosely based on USGS standards for discharge measurement errors for an estimate that would be expected to have relatively high uncertainty. And depending on the data available, um, you still may not have anything more than using a rule of thumb like plus or minus 20%, even for like an IES study. As the study level advances, you really wanna start to use a modeling approach to help define that uncertainty. Um, in most cases, this means using something like a hydraulic RAS model to estimate the upper and lower bound. All right, so in summary, listed here are the key things to estimate. How many extreme floods were occurred at this site? We're looking for large floods, not something that's similar to like the average or low flow range in our systematic data. We don't care as much about that because it's not impactful to our study. We want the big floods. And what are their approximate magnitudes? Describe each with an interval, which is, includes an upper and lower bound. We're gonna estimate perception thresholds from what you've learned from the historical events or other historical evidence. All right, so when we're looking into our systematic or historical data, it's good to know what type of gauge the data was recorded from and know how any historical floods at that gauge were estimated. A gauging station has almost all or all data as exact measurements where the flow is measured directly, but we can have indirect measurements or estimates based on rating curve extensions or slope area calculations. Knowing that will help put context to the quality or the uncertainty around the flow that we've been talking about. All right, so in conclusion, it is critically important to perform field reconnaissance and investigation on the largest flood stages and flows, understand the hydrologic setting and the discharge estimates and integrate the historical flood data into the gauging station records. So here are some photos of the largest floods in Wyoming. Um, the left is from the USGS files obtained from an office visit to Cheyenne. The right photos are of the river as seen about 75 years later. So a next step is to examine and include paleo flood data and botanical information. We'll talk about that in some later presentations. So in summary, we learned some more on collecting and examining data from various sources to find historical records of observed events. This process can take some time and digging deep to find a usable information that can lengthen our period of record. You should now be able to clearly define what a flow interval is and know how to add it into your flow frequency analysis. You should also be able to define what a perception threshold is and know enough to interpret historical records to be able to define perception thresholds for periods of record that have missing data. Um, remember that there are different levels of study. So based on study level, you should put in the appropriate amount of effort to do research as well as effort to estimate historical flow values with uncertainty. And just our learning recap, we described historical flow intervals and perception thresholds, and we examined historical records to understand perception thresholds to combine into a full period of record.